Number 10, Phantasma. Not her official name by any stretch, especially considering she isn't even technically a canon character yet, or even a confirmed variant of any kind. Who are we talking about here then? Phantasma was the name given to the Ghost Rider Champions variant cover character that Luciano Vecchio gave to the variant he was prompted to design for the series. For the new Champions team, Marvel decided to try out a series of variant covers with ideas of what imagined sidekicks or established heroes could look like and it's been suggested that some of the characters we see on the covers could even be making their way into canon. Regardless of whether they are considered canon or not, in regards to Marvel, I always think if a variant appears somewhere, even on a cover, it's possible that somewhere in the multiverse they could exist. And that could just be the case with Phantasma as well. After all, there are infinite realities. So if a character appears somewhere, even in a dream, I'm always like, that's probably a real character somewhere. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, be sure to show us you love us by clicking that like button. Seriously, it's good for you, it's good for me, it's good for the whole world. Number 9, Manitou Dawn. In the Prime Earth continuity, Manitou Dawn is an ancient and powerful magic user who originally came from Atlantis. After Atlantis sank, she was one of the few who survived this event and migrated, coming to America. She would end up being one of the people to establish the Native American Apache tribe. It was revealed during the events of the second volume of Justice League Dark that during her life, at one point, she was approached by and marked by Hecate, being one of the chosen few to bear her witch mark, symbolizing that Hecate had stored some of her power within Manitou Dawn. Number 8, Jennifer Kale. I feel like Jennifer Kale has come a long way since her humble origins in Fear issue number 11 from 1972. There she was basically a side character, a kind of kid companion to Marvel's Man-Thing. In fact, she reminds me of another story featuring DC Swamp Thing, where he saved a little girl only to later find out that she was actually possessed by a demon after going on some adventures with her. Took a while. But I digress. Who is Jennifer Kale? Well, she has attached the prophetic cult originally of the sunken city of Atlantis before it sank, another Atlantis tie-in, known as the Cult of Zerid Nam. Her grandfather, Joshua Kale, ended up as the leader of the cult in the modern age guarding their sacred texts. However, when his teenage daughter Jennifer visited and she was interested in witchcraft, she used one of his books to summon a demon. Fortunately, the man thing came along and saved her from Thog, the demon she had summoned. And it was through this initial adventure that it was discovered that Jennifer had established a psychic link with man thing. As a result of this adventure, Jennifer ends up being trained by Takim, once a pupil of the Zerid Nah, and has continued to be a strong and magical presence in the comics. Although every now and then she flips between kind of being a powerful witch and settling down into a normal life, or at least trying to. Number seven. Tim Hunter. Tim Hunter has the potential to be the most powerful magic user in all of DC, but most wouldn't know that because he's not their most popular or well-known character. Timothy Hunter made his first appearance in The Books of Magic issue number one in 1990. This means that although he bears a resemblance to J.K. Rowling's magical boy Harry Potter in terms of his appearance and in terms of his origin as a child of destiny, he actually greatly predates Potter. So while some might compare the two, it would actually be more accurate to suggest that Hunter may have inspired Potter and not the other way around. Tim Hunter was created by Neil Gaiman and John Bolton. He has many contradictory origin stories that are basically all in part true, and he's destined to become Earth's greatest magic user. Number six, Witchfire. Witchfire is one of my favorite lesser known magical superheroes out there. She's not just a magic user, but is also a musician as well. I think that's why I love her so much. She's got more going on than just magic, you know? Her Prime Earth version also happens to have one of the coolest designs, so that is also something that I absolutely love about her. She just looks so cool and she doesn't really get hyped enough because while she has an awesome design and backstory, she isn't a character who gets written about a bunch. So there is also an air of mystery to her that I think is just great. Number five, Detective Chimp. Detective Chimp might be a character some are familiar with, but ultimately a lot of folks out there do not know that he is tied to the world of magic. However, if you do know about him and haven't thought of him in this regard, you perhaps should not be too surprised considering that he does does get his intellect from a magical fountain, really, the Fountain of Youth. The Fountain of Youth gave Bobo not just an improved intellect, but also the ability to communicate with all animals, even gaining the ability to speak language so he could converse with humans as well, who, remember,
however, are also technically animals. Detective Chimp, aka Bobo T. Chimpanzee, as he is also known, would go on to become one of the greatest detectives on Earth, even rivaling the detective skills of Batman. Hence why many people don't think of him as being a magically based superhero, but he is. He also has the Sword of Night, so I mean like, this guy's he's got a lot of ties to magic, weirdly. Number 4. Khalid Nazur Khalid Nazur is lesser known than his uncle, Dr. Fate's Ken Nelson, but he is indeed also Dr. Fate, or one of the people to be known by that superhero name, I should say. Khalid takes up the mantle in his uncle's stead, or rather his great uncle's stead, as Khalid is actually the Egyptian-American great-nephew to Ken Nelson. Khalid became a member of the Justice Society of America and was also part of the group known as the Justice League Dark, a magical and more secretive spin-off team from the main Justice League superhero group. Khalid would become Dr. Fate at the behest of the Egyptian gods who chose him to take up the mantle. Before this, Khalid was simply a med student living in New York City. However, after answering the call to become the new Dr. Fate, he becomes his great uncle's protege studying under him. Number 3. Sister Grimm Nico Minoru has a pretty tragic story and while she's made a good number of appearances in the comics and is likely well loved and known by Runaways fans, folks who haven't checked out that series or the show based off of it likely won't be too familiar with her. That is to say, she isn't necessarily a household name, at least not yet. Nico has an interesting backstory. Like the other Runaways, she herself is a hero, but one who was born to a group of villains. Her parents were dark magic users and upon her running away from them, they attempted to permanently defeat Nico upon catching up to her. However, Nico wouldn't be defeated so easily. It turned out she herself was a magic user too, and the staff of one her mother attempted to run her through with was actually instead absorbed by her body. It became something that she could then use. Trying to get rid of someone with a magical artifact doesn't always work, it turns out, especially if they're magical. Number two, Amanda Sefton. Amanda Sefton is the adopted sister of mutant and X-Men member Nightcrawler. She is also one of Kurt's major love interests. Yeah, it's weird, it's complicated, but it's a thing. Amanda was actually an alias that she adopted when she went to investigate what her adopted brother, Kurt, was up to after the death of their other brother, Steven, was claimed to have been his fault. Undercover, Jermaine Zardos, which is her real name, became Amanda Sefton, and it was during this time that Kurt would actually fall for her, not recognizing that Amanda was his sister, Jermaine, at the time. Jermaine, or Amanda, as we more commonly know her now, is a powerful sorceress and has been an ally to the X-Men, also at one time belonging to their unofficial Muir Island team. Number 1. Scarlet Witch No, no, not that Scarlet Witch, this Scarlet Witch. Natalia Maximoff is the mother of Wanda Maximoff, but many people don't think about her or even know of her because Wanda's origins are so convoluted and complex. When most people think of Scarlet Witch, they think of her and her brother Quicksilver as the mysterious children of Magneto. However, this was later retconned in the comics and it was revealed that her birth parents were actually Natalia, the Scarlet Witch, and an unnamed man, known only as the Scarlet Warlock. In attempting to rescue her children from being kidnapped by the High Evolutionary, Natalia perished. Yeah, that's also a whole other thing. So Wanda now has a birth mother who was a magic user whom she inherited her powers from, as opposed to them really being a mutant in origin, especially because she's no longer a mutant either. Since her mutant genes were created to disguise that she and her brother were actually experimented on by the High Evolutionary. Why? I don't know. He's the High Evolutionary. He's weird, I guess. <laughs> and coming in at number 10, Vanish. Image Comics seems to be going back to its gritty, magical roots with Vanish. Vanish follows Oliver Harrison. This chosen one peaked at the age of 14 when he took down the leader of the biggest threat to his universe in a mystical place called the Everkeep. Now, as an adult, this chosen one indulges in every vice he can, living a mediocre, pretty sloppy life. Until a group of heroes show up called the Prestige, who are actually the followers of the threat that Oliver took down when he was 14. Now, using his magical abilities, Oliver takes it on himself to play the part of a hero in the disguise disguise of a villain to bring down the heroic prestige. The comic builds up this super cool magic but violent world. It's incredibly gritty but filled with dark fantasy and magic and it's just so cool. Number 9. Rogue Son Dylan Siegel has been living life with his mom when he's suddenly called to a reading of his estranged father's will. Now During that reading, 
he discovers his dear old dad was a superhero called Rogue Son, and now Dylan has been granted the superhero mantle for himself. Now, this super angsty teen is in charge of protecting our world from the forces of the supernatural while also trying to figure out who exactly took down his dad. The art in this story is awesome, and Rogue Son's suit is incredibly cool. With really cool fire based abilities and a whole lot of family drama, Rogue Son from Image Comics is a fun story you should definitely check out. Number eight, Dr. Multiverse. All right, breaking away from Image Comics now and landing firmly in DC's territory, we have Maya Chamara, Dr. Multiverse. Dr. Multiverse is alone in the multiverse, meaning there is only one of her. Originating from Earth 8, Maya was bathed in cosmic energies and was granted the powers of the multiverse, which basically means that she's able to see variants and alternate versions of people living in different realities. She can see people and objects passing between dimensions, and she has the ability to locate and track anything she has come into contact with throughout the multiverse. She also has access to vast energy manipulation abilities, which let her fire blasts and create shields, but she can totally open up portals to other universes and send people back to their own universe. This former member of the Retaliators became part of the Justice League Incarnate using her multiversal powers to help this multiversal team of heroes. She's like a DC version of Marvel's Captain Universe, Starbrand, and America Chavez all just mixed into one, and I think she's pretty all right. If you guys are enjoying this video so far, make sure you drop a like to let us know you want more videos similar to this one. This one little click saw you gotta do. Thanks. Number seven, Bat Walker. I'm gonna be honest, I just assumed this had already been done in the past, but no. Dinosaur versions of DC superheroes had not been done before. I'm all right with this because that means this year we were treated to the Jurassic League, a DC story that takes place on an Earth where heroes like Batman, Wonder Woman, and Superman are actually dinosaurs that protect the puny human race from the carnivore dinosaurs who would eat them. There's a Brachiosaurus Supersaur from another world who looks eerily like Superman, a Triceratops Wonder Dawn hailing from the Isle of Trimascara, and on the outskirts of Grautham City, we are introduced to Bat Walker, an Allosaurus who dresses up like a bat after the loss of his parents at the hands of an insane Dilophosaurus who goes by the name Jokerzard. I mean, there's even a panel of this comically green Allosaurus throwing a stone batarang, and it's just something that I never knew I needed in my life until this point. I'm just so glad it exists. Number six. The Spirit of Variance, Vox Igni. Sean Cassidy is not a new character by any stretch of the imagination, but in Legion of X number seven by Marvel, he does become something completely new. Sean was portrayed by Maura McTaggart, who stole his face so she could enter into Krakoa. So when he was brought back to life, he was rather upset. Now there's a whole thing going on as well with the character of Legion right now that I just can't get into, but essentially a character named Mother Righteous offers Legion a gift in the form of a certain kind of power. David Holler refuses this gift, but luckily for us, Sean Cassidy was there to take it instead. Making a deal with Mother Righteous, Cassidy was given, or I guess, possessed by a cast out spirit of vengeance called the Spirit of Variance. This transformed Banshee into a flaming skull version of himself named Vox Igni, which is the voice of fire. And if a name like that doesn't sound cool to you, then just look at this character. Good golly, he's awesome. Number five, Five, Bat Prince. Another alternate version of Batman, I know, but he belongs to probably one of my favorite alternate reality stories to come out of DC Comics, Dark Knights of Steel. This story takes place in a world of medieval fantasy where the Wayne family ruled their kingdom until the mother and father of Superman came to Earth. The L family house became rulers of the land after a horrible attack on the Wayne family. Now, as the surviving son of the Waynes, Bruce serves as both a knight and and son to the L family with his network of Robins and his brilliant mind. But as the world is at each other's throats in this story, this bat prince learns about the actions that led to his birth and the powers he now possesses as a half Kryptonian Dark Knight. Dark Knights of Steel that came out this year in 2022 just has so many interesting and fresh takes on classic DC characters. It's fresh and fun and I got a variant cover of the first issue and it looks so sweet. Maybe, maybe one day I'll let you guys see it, maybe. But definitely read this story. Definitely 
definitely do it. Number four, Miracle Man. Miracle Man is also not a new character. In fact, Marvel's Miracle Man is one of comics' most dramatic publishing debacles, coming back from 1954. Decades of rights battles over the character meant that he kind of bounced around publishers and then disappeared from the pages of comics altogether for a long, long time. Which is why it seemed way too good to be true when Marvel announced in 2013 that it had acquired the rights to Miracle Man. Now, over the years, the company has attempted to bring the character back, but even more legal issues kind of stopped that from being able to happen. But luckily, starting in October 2022, Neil Gaiman finally continued the Silver Age arc that he had created for the character, with Marvel planning a number of other Miracle Man books. So now, after all this time, we get both one of the newest and kind of one of the oldest characters all wrapped up into one awesome Miracle Man, Marvel Man, Mickey Moran, whatever you want to call him, shaped package. Number three, Abyss. All right, before you jump on me in the comments, this isn't the villain Abyss. That guy was Lex Luthor's own evil Batman, who was honestly kind of cool, but he did not last very long. Abyss was defeated by Batman, who got some massive help from a Bodnesian police officer named Detective Kea, who helped Batman not only survive, but even forced Abyss to retreat after he had defeated most of Batman Incorporated, which led him straight into a defeat at the hands of the Dark Knight himself. Now, after Abyss had been defeated, Kaya found some of the villain's equipment and decided to hunt down the ones who had ended her parents' lives. There's a lot of parallels between Batman and the characters in and around him in the later issues of Batman Volume 3 that came out this year in 2022. Anyways, Batman offered to help Kaya, but in helping her, he also talked her into just arresting the criminals instead of doing what she was planning to do, which I'm sure you can imagine what that was. She wasn't brought into Batman Inc., but she is now another ally of Batman. And I I hope she gets some more appearances in the comics from this point on because it the costume's pretty cool. Number two, the Joneses. How about a whole family of superheroes for this spot? And not just that, but also some social and political commentary wrapped up into it. That sounds like so much fun. Not really. Anyways, out of AWA Studios comes The Joneses, which is a spin-off of another AWA Studios comic called The Resistance, and it focuses on a suburban family who have gained superpowers after a global pandemic known as the Great Death. All four family members, mother, father, sister, and brother, were all transformed into something superhuman, but unfortunately, the world has begun to embrace fascism, born of fear of the pandemic, and the superpowered individuals that have appeared known as the Reborns. The Joneses face some pretty scary consequences if they are exposed as Reborns, and so they are presented with the dilemma of using their abilities for good at the risk of exposing themselves and inviting danger, or just laying low and staying out of the way. It's an interesting little idea for a comic book, and the global pandemic idea seems a little bit familiar. I don't know why. So I found it fun to just jump into this little 2022 comic from AWA Studios, and maybe you will too. Number one, Guts and Glory. If you're part of the Thunderbolts, are you really a hero? Yes, yes you are. The problem for me and this list is that when Guts and Glory first appeared in Thunderbolts Volume 4, number one from August 2022, we weren't really given much information on the guy and we still haven't been really, which makes my job way harder. He was placed on Hawkeye's Thunderbolts team under the mayor of New York, Luke Cage. The only reason given for this character's introduction to the team was that apparently having a quote, man of mystery would do wonders for the team's public relations. That's actually the reason. There's literally nothing else given about why he's here. He is a big stocky guy with cyborg body parts and an absolutely insane amount of weaponry, including a particle rupture laser, which I don't even want to imagine what that thing does to a person. It just sounds horrible. He also looks a bit like Cable, as he's a totally 90s cyber-inspired warrior, but just more military and not nearly as old as Cable, with absolutely no information about his backstory, again, or his training. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marvel. Please change this. Guts in is cool. Okay. Thank you. Number 10, Tosin Oduye. Tosin is such a cool character. Okay, so as a kid, Tosin Oduye saw the way that Wakanda became a socially isolated nation who believed themselves superior and seemed to always attract 
war. The Marube, the tribe Tosin belongs to, began to separate a bit from the main Wakandan people. They hated the way Wakanda used vibranium for tech, so they instead found a way to refine the vibranium and flow with it. They gave themselves vibranium tattoos, and some in their tribe, who trained hard enough, could have the vibranium flow with them, granting them some pretty cool powers. It's like they harness the energy of vibranium and can use it to move extremely fast, or unleash vibranium energy blasts, or even seemingly grant himself a vibranium armor. Last thing I want to say is that the covers for the issues of this volume of Black Panther are just so cool. Definitely check it out. Number 9. Aleph Chernikov Aleph Chernikov is a young mutant hero who appears in the Wolverine Patch flashback series by Larry Hama. This was a miniseries that came out earlier in 2022 and covered an untold tale from Patch's adventures in Madripoor back in the good old days. Here Patch works to help three Russian mutants who have escaped their government, but have been tracked to Madripoor. Madripoor's military, royal armed guards, as well as S.H.I.E.L.D. and Russia themselves appear to be after the mutants, but Patch, Archie, and Tiger Tiger intervene in hopes of helping the three. In the end they do, and among them is Aleph, the child of the other two mutants, David and Raysa. Aleph appears to be the main focus of everyone's efforts when it comes to hunting them down. They possess powerful healing abilities, psionic abilities, and possibly even the power to manipulate reality. But they're also a child, so of course everyone's like, we gotta protect this baby. Number 8. Bite Wing There's nothing that wins me over more than a puppy. But then, DC goes and gives a puppy a three-legged gray blue-eyed pitbull puppy and gives it to Nightwing, probably one of the best members of the Bat family. And then they go and give it the nickname of Bite Wing. I literally teared up just typing this part because of the overload of adorable that I got while looking at this. Haley the dog was being chased and mistreated by some teenagers when Dick Grayson stepped in, rescued, and adopted her. Now, the first sidekick turned full on hero in DC Comics has his very own super pet, especially after she was given a costume and the ability to speak from a fifth dimensional imp. Now, she fights alongside Nightwing as Bite Wing, and it's cute. It's very cute. Number seven. Escapade. I love Escapade, and I also love her BFF, Morgan Red. While initially introduced as a criminal in the Marvel Voices Pride issue of this year, I think it's safe to say that Escapade and her friend Morgan and his genetically engineered flying turtle pal, Hibbert, will soon become a team of mutant heroes instead of anti heroes. I mean, even if they are criminals who steal stuff, they really only try to steal stuff from the worst people, which makes them still pretty altruistic. Escapade is a trans mutant named Sheila Sexton, whose powers involve swapping places with whoever she decides to use her mutant power. Powers on. This can be someone as low level as a random passerby, or someone as high level as another super powered being who is about to defeat her, or even the President of the United States. So much potential for this power. Number 6. Bolt. Since the live action Black Adam movie was announced, DC decided that they would also put out a Black Adam solo series for the first time. Time. And in the first issue, it puts Black Adam on the ropes of mortality. In response to this, Black Adam finds his descendant, Malik Adam White, a medical student living in the Bronx. Basically, Black Adam just tells this guy he is going to succeed Black Adam and inherit his power. And then he forces him by having one of his people pop a cap in Malik, and the only way to save himself is to take Black Adam's ring and say Shazam. While Black Adam calls Malik White Adam, Malik gives a good little lecture about the inherent racism there. So, he prefers to go by Thunderbolt or just straight up Bolt. From what I've read, I really like his character, and he is supposed to represent a sort of form of redemption for the character of Black Adam because, as they say in the comic, there is no true redemption for Black Adam. Not at this point, at least. Number five, Amass. Amass is a really cool new mutant. They made their first appearance in Steve Orlando's Marauder series in issue number four. Amass is a mutant of Threshold, the oldest mutant civilization to have ever existed. They, along with two other mutants, had their minds stored within a codex, hoping that they would arrive in the future after being restored and would be able to seek help for their people who were on the brink of extinction when they last left them in the past. Amass's mutant powers allow them to physically combine mutants and their powers together, joining together to create one basically big ball of mutants, which kind of looks like one big being. Hence their mutant name of Amass. This appears to both psychologically and physically combine whichever mutants they choose with themselves, with their new combined form also possessing all the powers of said mutants, which I think is pretty nuts. Number four, Grey Wolf. Of the characters I'm talking about on this list, my favorites are absolutely a three-way tie between Tosin, Bitewing, and this guy. 
Grey Wolf. Okay, so Lex Luthor was running a crime fighting experiment around the world trying to create a group of his own similar to Batman Incorporated, with the ultimate goal of creating Abyss, his own Batman. But then he abandoned all these projects that then went wild doing their own thing. So Batman Incorporated's international team, being led by Ghostmaker, go on a mission to bring them down in Batman 2022 Annual Volume 3, number one from July. Their first mission is to Kazbek, Chechnya to take on Grey Wolf. Grey Wolf was unleashed on the city to help its citizens who had been exposed to Lazarus resin that had made them all extremely violent. With Ghostmaker, he was able to cure the residents and join Batman Inc. as a good guy, but he displayed enough skill to best Dark Ranger, El Gaucho, and Batman of Japan in a three-on-one fight, and he beat Wingman one-on-one. -on -one. Also, he's like seven feet tall minimum. Super cool. Number three, Black Mist. Black Mist is a completely new character who is not yet a member of Batman Incorporated, but who might end up becoming one in the future. She was actually one of my favorite characters to appear in Batman Inc. issue number one from 2022. Not only does she look like a badass, but she also seems to be wary of joining up with Batman Inc. Black Mist appears as a sort of consulting detective in issue number one of the third volume of this series. We don't know much about her yet, but she seems to be working with Batman Incorporated to help them solve the mystery behind just who is killing all the teachers of Batman and Ghostmaker, and why and how this perpetrator is doing that. One thing we do know about Black Mist straight out of the gate is that she seems to have history with the Knight. The two recognize each other and are presented as friendly to one another. Number two, Egro the Unbreakable. Okay, so this one definitely took me by a bit of a surprise. Coming out of the 2022 volume of Thunderbolts, specifically issue number two, we are introduced to Egro. Egro is a super interesting little troll looking monster who lives peacefully on Monster Isle. But you see, Egro heard of the monster exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, so naturally he expected to go and see his own statue. He just had to make sure that it captured his true beauty. But what the heck? They didn't have a statue for Egro the Unbreakable? An insult like that could not fly, so he obviously had to destroy the other statues for the other monsters, which brought the Thunderbolts to fight him. Instead, after Egro punched Power Man through the roof with his big lava hands and ink incapacitated persuasion with his telepathic abilities, which helped him learn English, he surrendered to America Chavez and explained the situation. Then he was invited to join the team. Yay! Happy ending for the little steroid Yoda. Number one, Nightmite. Just like Superman has Mr. Mixie as Pitalik and Batman has Batmite, Dick Grayson, the superhero known as Nightwing, now has his own imp superfan from the fifth dimension. Dixel, though Dixel prefers to be known as Nightmite. Well, it might seem strange to put an M from the fifth dimension on a superhero list given, you know, some of their track records. Nightmite is genuinely well-meaning and helpful, unlike most other imps who are somewhat mischievous or just downright troublesome. Being an imp from the fifth dimension also means that Dixel can be super powerful as he has magical, reality bending and warping powers. Nightmite made his first appearance very recently in the comics as of the time of this recording in issue number 98 of Nightwing, which was released in November of 2022. Number 10. Boomerang. Fred Myers was born in Australia, but moved to America when he was but a small child. In America, due to his great love of baseball, he developed an extraordinary pitching arm. He became a professional baseball player in the minor leagues after graduating high school, and a few years later, entered the major leagues. Within a year, he was suspended though for accepting bribes. With an arm like that and no job, he was eventually contracted by the subversive criminal organization, the Secret Empire, and offered employment. For him, they designed designed special weaponry for him to exploit his pitching ability, and he became their special operative, codenamed Boomerang. Why Boomerang? No idea, because he's Australian probably. Now Boomerang's first fight was actually with the Incredible Hulk, which makes no sense at all. Eventually he would recalibrate his aspirations and take on more reasonable heroes like Spider-Man, which he did multiple times, but notably as part of the Sinister Syndicate, and he even had his own Sinister Six team. Number nine, White Rabbit. For someone so incredibly inept at committing crimes, White Rabbit sure does have a relatively long history in Marvel Comics. In the beginning, sheltered rich girl Girl, Lorena Dodson committed her first crime by ending the life of her 87 year old arranged husband as she found the trophy wife life boring. She then used her inheritance to buy a bunch of high tech equipment and being inspired by Alice in Wonderland, she went off as the villainous White Rabbit. For her first crime, she shall rob a fast food joint. This dastardly crime brought her into confrontation with the most fearsome of heroes, 
Frogman. And she almost brought him down too if it wasn't for the intervention of Spider-Man, who finished her off with an astounding amount of ease. Spider-Man has actually defeated her on multiple different occasions with the same amount of ease, and she's even been defeated by Mary Jane Watson. Don't even get me started on the amount of animal-themed villains she has allied with. In fact, she's allied with a lot of other low-level villains as well, but never to any amount of great success. She does have a giant, heavily armed robotic rabbit though, and that part, that part is kind of cool. Number eight, the Menagerie. The Menagerie is a slightly more recent evil team, showing up for the first time in Amazing Spider-Man Volume 3, number one, in April of 2014. This was when they tried stealing a valuable decorated egg from an antique store and were pretty easily defeated. So like from the get-go, the impressive feats are on the lower side with this team. In fact, I'd say the most famous thing they've ever done is when they disintegrated Spider-Man's spider suit, making him have to create web underwear for himself. And it's the underwear that is remembered here, not the team. The animal-themed criminal team was created by White Rabbit, who we just talked about, and its members included Hippo, Ox, Gine, who did the Spider-Man suit disintegrating, a squid, Swarm, and wait for it, Pandamania. Very cool. The Menagerie also is known for trying to rob a club where Nadia Van Dyne was celebrating her birthday with numerous other heroes, which as you can imagine, did not work out well for them. Number seven, critical mass. I just want to say that I think Marvel has something against severely overweight people. The amount of supervillains who are just massive is actually ridiculous. We got the Slug, the Blob, the Shadow King, Pink Pearl, the Kingpin too, although that's actually all muscle, and then there's critical mass, AKA Arnie Gunderson. Arnie Arnie was one of Peter Parker's classmates back in the fourth grade, and eventually he gained the mutant ability to project explosive forces from his fingertips, which is actually a really cool power. But that didn't save Arnie from being just a massive man for seemingly no reason. Together with some other evil mutants, he formed the Band of Baddies, and with a name like that, you know we got some real winners here. The band abducted another explosive mutant named Mary Beck, which brought them into conflict with Wolverine and Spider-Man. Unfortunately for the baddies, one of their number threatened Mary, who then accidentally unleashed her powers, taking out every single one of the villains on this team. And we never saw Critical Mass ever again. The end. Lasted three issues of Marvel Comics Presents. That's it. He's gone. Number six, Big Wheel. Hey! Do you want to be a villain? Great! Just hire another guy to make you a big wheel with rocket launchers and all that stuff on it that you can just ride around in. It's that easy! That's what Jackson Wheel did. Can you guess what he called himself? When he first appeared, Big Wheel used his big wheel to chase and try to take out Rocket Racer while he was mid-fight with Spider-Man. Big Wheel wasn't even facing Spider-Man one-on-one, he just showed up. Just before he was about to get crushed though, Spider-Man pulled Racer out of the way and Big Wheel drove right off the side of a building and right into the Hudson River, ending both Jackson Wheel and his big wheel. All of this because Rocket Racer had some blackmail. That's all it was. Number five, Hypno Hustler. Just look. Look at this dazzling man. What an icon. The Hypno Hustler made his debut in the 80s, which I hope is not a surprise to anyone. Just look at him. He uses a hypnotic guitar to hypnotize people, wears headphones that stop him from hypnotizing himself, which is hilarious, and has boots that emit knockout gas and have retractable knives in them for some reason. It's a crazy combo. His story involves him performing at the nightclub Beyond Forever, where Peter Parker and his pals just happen to be hanging out. Him and his band used their hypnotic grooves to hypnotize a crowd into giving up their goods. Peter Parker though, being the hero, obviously knows what's going on and changes into his Spidey suit. During the fight, he realizes that the headphones are the only thing keeping Hypno Hustler from hypnotizing himself, and Spider-Man, he just removes them. That's it and the fight's over. Number four, the headmen. Sometimes it just takes the smallest of things to bring people together. And while that may sound like an extremely beautiful sentiment, I'm saying it in relation to the villainous team known as the headmen, who seem to have come together just because each of their powers revolve around their heads in one way or another. And it's honestly, kind of unsettling in my opinion. Bonded together through their weird heads, these scientists sought out world domination, bringing them into conflict with the Defenders, She-Hulk, and of course, Spider-Man. The quartet consisted of Arthur Nagin, their leader, who had his head transplanted onto the body of a gorilla for some reason, Ruby Thursday, who replaced her own head with an organic computer capable of changing shape, which is actually really cool, Gerald Morgan, aka Shrunken Bones, accidentally shrank his own skeleton, including his skull, so he basically just has really 
baggy skin, which is very creepy, and Chandu the mystic's head had been transplanted by Negan onto a number of different bodies through his time, making him actually quite versatile. Number three, Sly. A chemical engineer turned super thief, decked out in a super slippery suit, Jalome Bleacher created a chemical coating that basically eliminated the friction between an object and any surface it came into contact with. Which, not even joking here, that could be really, really useful. Like, good job, man, that would work really well in the real world. Too bad the company that he worked for closed their R&D department and Jalome had to find a way to independently fund his project. Honestly, I would just find another company who wanted to fund me, but then I wouldn't appear on a list of people you've never heard of. And that is a goal of mine. He created a suit with the chemical and used his slippery abilities to rob banks and try to destroy his old boss's business. His only other notable mentions were his midlife crisis and his eventual passing into the afterlife in a side story of the Civil War event where he was attacked from behind for refusing to side with crime boss Hammerhead. I guess you could say that they had some friction Sorry. Number two, Spider-Side. Sony's animated Spider-Verse films have not only achieved tremendous success, but have also popularized the concept of multiverse storytelling, encouraging audiences to embrace innovative takes on Spider-Man's character. Within this realm of creative exploration, Spider-Side emerges as a rather obscure figure originating from the controversial Clone Saga. In that tangled web of narratives, Spider-Side assumes the role of a perplexing third party alongside Peter Parker and Ben Riley casting doubt on the true identity of the authentic Spider-Man. Now as the story unfolds, Spider-Side's transformation takes a dark and pretty unsettling turn when he evolves into a molecular monstrosity that bears a closer resemblance to the grotesque shape-shifting abilities of Carnage rather than the iconic traits of Spider-Man himself. His character complicated the already pretty complex story, but he was also actually pretty cool, and I always wondered if we would see him again, and we have with the opening up of the Spider-Verse. Yay! Number one, Stegron. In the world of Spider-Man, the lizard was born from Dr. Kurt Connors' experiments with reptile DNA. However, if you ever wondered what would transpire should Connors delve into the realm of dinosaur DNA, Vincent Stegron, known as Stegron the Dinosaur Man, provides the very answer you would expect. After a fateful journey to the Savage Land, Connors embarks on a scientific endeavor that basically creates the exact same lizard villain, but as a humanoid Stegosaurus. Notably, Stegron possesses raw power that technically actually surpasses other animal-based villains like the lizard and the rhino. He has crossed paths with formidable adversaries such as Venom on multiple occasions and even forged a not at all surprising partnership with the lizard in the Marvel team-up series. Yet, it's his untamed and wild nature that has occasionally posed challenges for the character. But also, he's a Stegosaurus. I see why I didn't catch on. At number 10 is Brother Power the Geek from DC. Brother Power the Geek is a bizarre hero you've probably never heard of who emerged in the turbulent era of 1968. He's like a funky mix of Frankenstein and a hippie's fashion statement. Imagine a Taylor's dummy being struck by lightning, brought to life, and then dressed in counterculture attire. That's pretty much brother power for you. He joined the psychedelic circus, ran for Congress, and even clashed with the biker gang, all in just two comic issues. But here's the kicker. In his final issue, brother power was shot into space, courtesy of none other than Ronald Reagan. It took him like two decades to return from comic limbo in Swamp Thing Annual Number 5, but then he was reimagined as a failed elemental. And just like that, this quirky hero slipped back into the shadows of comic book obscurity. At number 9 is Normal Man from Renegade Press. Normal Man is a hero who never asked for his predicament. He burst onto the scene in Cerebus 56 back in 1983, a time when the comic book world was dominated by the likes of Superman and Batman. This unlikely hero is a spoof on Batman's legendary origin story. Instead of being a Kryptonian, he hails from the planet Levram, a world where everyone boasts superpowers. Except for him, of course. Norm L was the odd one out, the lone powerless guy in a planet teeming with extraordinary abilities. But rather than wallow in self-pity, Normal Man embraced his role, embarking on adventures alongside characters like Captain Everything. Normal Man might not have a blockbuster movie franchise or a fancy costume, but his story is a testament to the power of embracing your uniqueness, even in a world where everyone else seems superhuman. If you're enjoying this video so far, please 
support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Top 10 Nerd, and ringing that notification bell, all of which are free. At number eight is Skate Man from Pacific Comics. Skate Man is a roller derby hero with a tragic twist. One of those hidden gems in the world of comics. Created in the 80s by Neil Adams, this character's story is a roller coaster of emotions. Billy Moon, a Vietnam vet turned roller coaster derby sensation, accidentally takes out his friend Jack during a match. This tragic accident sends him down a dark path as he learns that it wasn't just a freak accident, it was orchestrated by a ruthless biker gang targeting his girlfriend. Moon's transformation into Skate Man, complete with a colorful scarf and roller skates, adds a unique layer to the superhero archetype. This one-shot wonder may not be a household name, but his gripping story and distinctive persona make him a noteworthy addition to the pantheon of lesser-known superheroes. At number seven is Super Teens from Archie Comics. Ah, Archie Comics, the beloved home of the Riverdale's iconic gang that actually gave birth to some truly unheard of superheroes. Ever hear of Pure Heart the Powerful? Probably not. This average high school student, aka Archie Andrews, could morph into a flying powerhouse by tapping into his pH factor. No, not chemistry, it's having a pure heart. Yet after his heroic deeds, everyone around him would have a memory wipe. Isn't that a nifty way to keep a secret identity? But the fun didn't stop with Archie. Betty turned into super teen, Jughead donned the title of Captain Hero, and Veronica embraced her inner vanity as Miss Vanity. And Reggie, well, he became evil heart. Sounds pretty ominous. Even the pint-sized little Archie joined in, forming a crew as the Super Teens. They teamed up with Archie Comics' Crusaders for a limited two-issue series, leaving us with an uncharted world of unassuming, unstoppable heroes. At number six is Super Hip from DC Comics. Super Hip isn't your average superhero. I mean, we're talking about Bob Hope's nephew who, when he gets a bit cheesed off, transforms into a groovy superhero, which they call Super Hip. And he rocked the latest Carnaby Street fashion. It's like the ultimate blend of teenage rebellion and superhero shenanigans. But that's not all. Super Hip went to Benedict Arnold High School where the teachers were inspired by classic Universal Studios monsters, talking Dracula and Frankenstein vibes right in the classroom. So the next time you're pondering who the coolest unheard of superheroes are, don't forget to give Super Hip a nod. At number five is Stingray from Marvel. Stingray is a Marvel comic superhero, but he's a bit like the unsung hero of the deep blue sea. Picture an oceanographer turned tech genius with a vision to create a utopian underwater city. Ever heard of Rapture? That's Walter Newell for you. He whipped up a slick suit that lets him explore the ocean's depths, and voila, Stingray was born. Now, you might not have heard much about him because he often plays the role of a supporting character. He's actually teamed up with heavy hitters like Namor, the Avengers, and the 50 State Initiative. But here's the kicker. Despite being around for half a century, he's only shown up in fewer than 200 comics. It's like having a superstar status, but hanging out backstage. If Stingray ever made a splash in the MCU, he could definitely be the oceanic hero we never knew we needed. At number four is is Ultra the Multi-Alien. Ultra the Multi-Alien is an obscure gem from DC Comics. Imagine you're just a regular space traveler minding your business and then suddenly you crash land on a planet with four wannabe conquerors who blast you with transformation ray guns simultaneously. What do you get? Well, not your average superhero, that's for sure. One leg turns into lightning, the other grows feathers and talons. One arm becomes magnetic, and the other becomes super strong with green fur. It's like a mashup of superpowers, and the best part, he could revert to his original form with a nifty device. So Ace Arn decides to become a superhero and takes the stage in mystery in space. A quirky hero with a unique super set, Ultra deserves a little more love among the comic book greats. At number three is 3D Man. Ever heard of 3D Man? No? Well, you're not alone. But this Marvel character has a history dating back to 1977. Chuck Chandler, a test pilot, was once kidnapped by Skrulls, those shape-shifting alien baddies. But Chuck didn't take it lying down. He sabotaged their spacecraft and made a run for it. And that's where it gets interesting. See, as Chuck fled, he vanished into a burst of light where the Skrull ship exploded. But that's not the end of the story. His brother Hal saw something truly bizarre. See, Chuck's essence got imprinted on Hal's eyeglasses, turning Chuck into a two-dimensional being. When Hal focused he could release Chuck, and they'd merge into a superhuman powerhouse with triple the strength, speed, and stamina of your average Joe. Now, 3D Man might not be on everyone's radar, but the legacy lives on through a character named Triathlon, who even joined the Avengers. So some obscure superheroes are hiding out there in a Marvel universe, sometimes hiding in plain sight. And number two is Two Pew Pew Kid from Marvel. Ever hear of the two 
kid? The two pew pew kid? No, well you're not alone. This unsung Marvel hero might not be as flashy as Iron Man or as powerful as Thor, but he's got a unique charm of his own. Matt Hawks started his life as a Harvard lawyer in the 1800s, but Destiny took him to a small town where he trained under a legendary slinger. When he was all trained up, he donned the iconic cowboy hat and became the infamous cowboy, making his debut in 1962. What sets him apart is his time traveling escapades though. He's been zipping back and forth between the past and the present, even at one point lending a hand to the Avengers. Despite his long history, he's been overshadowed by the big names with his appearances being sporadic outside the 70s. But don't underestimate the Pew Pew Kid, cause he's one of Marvel's unsung heroes. At number one is Bullet Man and Bullet Girl from Fawcett Comics. Have you ever heard of Bullet Man and Bullet Girl? I hope not, then I would have failed. But these two are some of the most underrated superheroes in the comic book universe. Jim Barr, a former forensic scientist, concocted a serum intended to rid people of their criminal tendencies. However, when he tested it on himself, he found himself supercharged with enhanced strength and intellect. Just like that, he became Bullet Man. Sporting a nifty gravity regulating helmet, Bullet Man could soar through the skies. And now to be outdone, his girlfriend and later wife, Suzanne Kent, donned a costume of her own, joining the ranks as Bullet Girls. These two love Lovebirds fought crime together, and their adventure started back in 1940, but sadly they disappeared a decade later. DC Comics later breathed new life into these heroes by licensing them in the 70s. They all became a part of the Marvel family, the All-Star Squadron, and the Seven Soldiers of Victory, cementing their place in the superhero pantheon. So the next time you're chatting about superheroes, don't forget to mention Bullet Man and Bullet Girl, because they might not be the most famous, but they definitely are super. Just because a hero isn't a household name doesn't mean they can't inspire us or teach us something. And who knows, maybe one of these lesser known characters will become one of your new favorite superheroes. Number 10, Fu Manchu. This villain is more remembered for the facial hair he inspired and for being an incredibly offensive stereotype than he is for his fictional acts of villainy. Fu Manchu was created all the way back in 1912 by an English author named Sax Romer after he asked a Ouija board how he would make his fortune, and I swear this is true, the board spelled out a racial slur that inspired him to come up with the character. Dr. Fu Manchu has studied at various universities and has four doctorates. He is a crime boss who uses members of various secret societies as his enforcers, as well as various dangerous exotic animals like cobras and spiders to attack his enemies. His his goal is to take over the world so that he can restore China to its former glory. He has a daughter named Falo Sui who is frequently trying to usurp him by teaming up with the heroes who are trying to defeat him. He is most frequently paired against the heroes of the novels, Dennis Nalen Smith and Dr. Petri. He is one of the first supervillains in fiction, but his legacy is far overshadowed by the fact that he is directly responsible for starting the yellow panic trope in fiction, where Asian characters began being consistently written as plotting and dangerous masterminds trying to bring down the white man. He has had a permanent impact on fiction as a result, inspiring other dicey characters like Marvel's The Mandarin. Number 9, The Fly. The problem with having heroes who kill their villains is that you don't get many recurring enemies as a result. This is especially true for the pulp hero known as the Spider, who is a millionaire who dresses up in a disguise and brutally murders his opponents. He is a character known for his bloodlust, kind of like the Punisher of his time, but one of the few villains who managed to give the Spider any repeated trouble was the Fly. First appearing in the August 1934 issue of Spider Magazine in the story Prince of the Red Looters, the Fly is also a wealthy playboy who has become bored and decides to take up crime as a hobby. At the story's start he has killed four men and stolen $50,000. Despite most of the criminal underworld being terrified of the spider, the Fly places an ad in the paper with an invitation saying, won't you come into my parlor? The two meet and the Fly challenges the spider to a sword fight. The two men are evenly matched and the Fly eventually pulls a gun, but being the sporting type, he doesn't kill him and instead ties the spider up and leaves him for the police. The fly goes on to rob a bank, leaving a massive trail of carnage in his wake. He is smart enough to deduce that the spider is really Richard Wentworth and makes several assassination attempts on him. He sends his stolen goods in the mail to the various gangsters of the city in order to earn their support and uses his newfound syndicate to rob several banks across the city. By the end of the story, the spider and the fly engage in another sword fight that seems to end with the fly's death, but in a move that was highly unusual in the Spider magazine, he returned a year and a half later in the story Green Globes of Death, where he developed gas weapons that caused his victims to bleed from every pore. As I mentioned in my hero version of this video, spider stories were incredibly violent, with death tolls routinely going into the thousands by the end of each book. 
Number eight, Voodoo Master. One of the recurring foes of the Shadow is Dr. Rodel McQueeno, who has hypnotic powers that he has attained through the use of black magic, which allow him to take control of people's minds and make them a part of his mindless zombie-like horde. He used these abilities to come to New York and start a cult, which he used to attain wealth. This brought him into conflict with the Shadow, who shot him and presumed him dead. Unfortunately, Voodoo Master returned and began an experiment which he planned to run on the entire human race. He planned to gain a massive amount of followers in the United States, but felt that the machine age was making this more difficult to accomplish. So, once he settled in the town of Hampstead and began enacting his scheme, he also began destroying the city's various factories. The Voodoo Master made three appearances in the original Shadow Magazine stories before being permanently killed off, but he is also a recurring character in the Dynamite Entertainment comic book series featuring the Shadow. Number 7. The Sky Band the Skyband are a gang of villains who battle the pulp hero known as the Phantom in several stories throughout the character's history. The Skyband are an all-female group of sky pirates who terrorize the air. They are led by a woman named the Baroness, who has an unrequited love for the Phantom, despite them being on opposite sides of the law. Another member of the gang, named Sala, is also in love with the Phantom, and frequently comes into contact and or conflict with the hero many times throughout his storied history, and once the Baroness dies in her first appearance, Sala takes over the gang. They are a mainstay of the Phantom mythology, appearing in the original comic strips, the comic books published by Gold Key, Charlton, DC, Marvel, Moonstone, and Dynamite Comics. They also appeared in an episode of the Defenders of the Earth cartoon, which featured the Phantom fighting alongside Mandrake the Magician and Flash Gordon in space, although in this version they were of course space pirates. Their most notable appearance is probably in the 1996 movie starring Billy Zane, where Sala was played by Catherine Zeta-Jones. Number 6, Dr. Death. There are actually two Dr. Deaths. The first one was a recurring villain of a rather boring hero named Nibs Holloway, who was a troubleshooter for a jewelry company. This Dr. Death was an international criminal who of course stole jewelry. He died at the end of his first appearance, but due to reader interest, was brought back for a second story. He died again, before being resurrected for one more time for a fourth and final story. The character proved more popular than the hero, and being that it was difficult to come up with scenarios where a jewelry store troubleshooter would come into conflict with an over-the-top supervillain, a new Dr. Death was created and given his own book. The new Dr. Death was a mad scientist named Dr. Rance Mandarin, who used to be the Dean of Psychology at Yale before he lost his mind and decided that he would use both scientific and occult methods to kill as many people as possible, believing that the world was becoming overpopulated. His enemy was a supernatural detective named Jimmy Holm, who who would, st who would stop all the doctor's plans and eventually marry his niece, Nina. Number five, Ming the Merciless. When the Earth was bombarded by a series of meteors, Dr. Hans Zarkov built a spaceship to locate the meteor's planet of origin. He set off to space with a woman named Dale Arden and a man named Flash Gordon in tow. They traveled to the planet Mongo, which they discovered was being ruled by an evil emperor named Ming the Merciless. Ming immediately wanted to marry Dale and forced Flash to fight in his gladiatorial battle arena. He became a staple of the Flash Gordon mythos and has appeared in every subsequent version of the series from the original 1934 comic strips to the subsequent film serials of 1936, 38, and 1940. He went up against Flash and the gang again in the 1979 and 1996 animated series, as well as the 1986 Defenders of the Earth series and a 2007 live action series for the Sci Fi Channel. Although he is perhaps most well known to modern audiences for his appearance in the 1980 feature film where he was played by Max von Sydow. He has a bit of a complicated legacy as he is clearly inspired by negative Asian stereotypes like Fu Manchu, but since he's technically an alien, this issue has been avoided in certain adaptations by making him a generic white dude in the 2007 series or a green reptilian alien in the Defenders of the Earth series. Number 4, Shiwan Khan. All right, this is the last of the Yellow Peril style villains on this list. The Shadow's arch nemesis, Shiwan Khan, has a kind of funny backstory, as in the pulp novels, he is said to be the last living descendant of Genghis Khan. Of course, due to DNA testing, we now know that Genghis Khan had so many children that one in 200 people alive today are descended from him. But let's go with it. Shiwan is intent on living up to his ancestor's legacy by conquering as much of the world as possible. He operated out of the lost city of Xanadu, where he was trained by Tibetan monks who taught him how to harness his telepathic powers and become invisible, clairvoyant, and how to control the dead. 
Shi Shiwan Khan is far and away the most often recurring shadow villain, appearing in pulp stories The Golden Master, Shiwan Khan Returns, The Invincible Shiwan Khan, and Masters of Death. He's also appeared at some point in every subsequent comic book iteration of The Shadow, including those published by Archie Comics, DC Comics, Dark Horse Comics, and Dynamite Entertainment. He's also the main antagonist of the 1994 live action Alec Baldwin starring Shadow movie. Number three, John Sunlight. Doc Savage, the man of bronze who has an Arctic headquarters called the Fortress of Solitude and whose first name is Clark, is an obvious source of inspiration for Superman. Although he doesn't have actual superpowers and was instead trained from birth to be an expert in almost every field and to achieve peak human condition. He is an incredibly effective pulp hero and as a result never really had many repeat villains other than John Sunlight, who managed to survive his first encounter with Doc Savage only to be killed in his second appearance. John Sunlight is the only character who can match Savage in intelligence and even overcome him in strength. As a result, the two have an immense respect for each other even if they are enemies. He has the ability to hypnotize all but the most intelligent of men, and his goal is to end world hunger, war, and intolerance. Unfortunately, he wants to do this by becoming the ruler of the world, so this doesn't really gel with Savage's goals. In the first story, The Fortress of Solitude, he escaped from an Arctic Russian prison before he came across Doc's fortress, which was filled with Savage's most deadly inventions. He began selling these weapons to rival armies who were at war. At the end of this adventure, Savage came across remains that seemed to imply that Sunlight had been eaten by a polar bear, but it was actually Sunlight who ended the bear and went on to try and get his revenge on Savage in the story The Devil Genghis, where the hypnotized masses turned on him and tore him limb from limb. The character has appeared in the years since in several of the various Doc Savage comic books that have come out in the years since. Number two, Dr. Satan. Weird Tales magazine is best known for publishing the stories of authors like Seabury Quinn and H.P. Lovecraft, and H.P. Lovecraft. And though they did publish a few recurring characters, they didn't really go in for the hero or villain pulps that would one day evolve into the superheroes we know today. However, they did have one hero and villain pair that they would publish eight adventures of between 1933 and 1934. The hero was an occult detective named Ascot Keen, but it was the more colorful villain who received top billing. Dr. Satan. Dr. Satan would use occult magic in order to enact criminal schemes, such as causing plants to grow out of men's skulls and reanimating dead bodies to, to pose as kidnap victims in order to extort people for money. Although we never learned his true identity, we did learn that he is actually just a rich playboy who learned magic and turned to crime out of boredom. This character has fallen into the public domain, so you could make your own Dr. Satan stories and no one could stop you. Number one, Superman. Fans of the Man of Steel may know that Superman was created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster and first appeared in Action Comics number one in 1938 before taking the world by storm and becoming one of the most enduring and iconic pop culture icons of all time. What not everyone is aware of is that Clark Kent was not the first Superman that Siegel and Schuster created. In 1933, five years before Action Comics number one, the pair published a short story in issue three of the fanzine Science Fiction, The Advance Guard of Future Civilization, under the pseudonym of Herbert S. Fine. The character was a poor, bald man named Bill Dunn who was in a breadline before being selected by a scientist to be the subject of an experiment. The chemicals that the professor made Bill ingest granted him telepathic powers and he killed the scientist. This Superman decides to use his powers to conquer the world, but soon discovers that the effects of the potion are temporary and without the scientist, he will soon be a poor nobody on the breadlines once again. Siegel and Schuster would end up reusing the name when they created their more famous character, but the two would eventually introduce another bald villain for the new Superman to fight. Number 10, Killer Moth. Killer Moth, unlike a lot of the characters on this list, isn't really that powerful, but that's not what makes them underrated and in need of more attention. Killer Moth is just fun. Drury Walker first appeared all the way back in Batman number 63 from February of 1951, and his whole shtick is just goofy. While other characters have taken their inspiration from having similar backstories to the Batman, the Killer Moth wanted to be the criminal's version of Batman, so he got himself a moth signal and a moth mobile and the name of Killer Moth. Ah! So scary! Not really. He even set up a false identity as millionaire philanthropist Cameron Van Cleer. In that form, he 
became friends with Bruce Wayne, which is actually interesting. I doubt he even knew about Bruce's hobby of bat cosplay, but meanwhile, he promoted himself to Gotham's criminals using his identity as Killer Moth, giving them each an infrared moth signal to call him to their aid. Now he didn't really fight for them. Instead, he kind of just became the distraction for the authorities so the real criminals could get away. You see why he really didn't become so popular? It's just kind of hilarious, and although his character has evolved a bit by then, no one has taken him that seriously, so just like Kite Man, he needs his time to shine. Number 9. Calendar Man Julian Gregory Day, whose name is a pun on the Julian and Gregorian calendars, has an obsession with dates. Committing crimes that always have a relationship to the date that they are being committed on usually covering the major holidays. Like most of the messed up members of the Batman's rogues gallery, Calendar Man has a rough childhood. His parents neglected him, which almost resulted in his passing away from days of exposure, which in turn resulted in his complete psychotic obsession of days and holidays. I don't know how those two mix, that's just how it goes. First appearing in Detective Comics number 259 in September 1958, Calendar Man was a bit sillier, using different costumes to commit crimes based on the days of the calendar, like dressing as an Indian magician representing the monsoon season. But after the crisis on Infinite Earths, Calendar Man was barely used and got a great revamp by writer Jeff Loeb in Batman The Long Halloween. In this new version, Calendar Man was institutionalized in Arkham Asylum and was deemed as an insane, ruthless criminal with abbreviations of the months tattooed around his head in a circle with no silly costumes or ridiculous crimes. Just his name. Number 8. Wrath. A young, successful, and secretly entirely evil CEO, Wrath is capable of being both Batman and Bruce Wayne's number one nemesis and antithesis, and yet almost no one cares or knows about him. Wrath first appeared back in 1984 as basically an anti-Batman. And while that may sound like a lazy writing exercise and may make you think he won't be popular, he did it before the major villain Prometheus ever even conceived of the idea. Wrath's parents were two burglars who were accidentally taken from this plane of existence by a young police officer who stumbled upon them and thought they were robbing their own house. As you can imagine, this is quite the villain backstory to turn a young Wrath completely against the law. He then dedicated his whole existence to going against them. Wrath even ended up training a young ward of his own named Elliot Caldwell, who you might have guessed became his version of Robin. Caldwell eventually takes on the role of Wrath himself, filling in his mentor's shoes, and he remained as the villain after the New 52 reboot. And yet, Wrath is nowhere to be seen, and you basically probably never heard of him. And you probably never will. Number 7, Colonel Sulphur. This Denny O'Neill created villain from the 70s is an espionage expert with weaponized artificial hands a tool he has used to commit very espionage type crimes. He's very Bond villainy if we're being honest. Colonel Sulphur has a strange sunlight fixation, meaning he only allows himself to act on his violent urges in the quote, morning's earliest minutes, which is one hell of a specific yet very obscure time frame for criminal activity. He did actually prove to be a bit more of a threat though when he joined the Army of Crime. When the Army of Crime's activities were challenged by Batman and Superman, Sulphur used an alien weapon to trap Superman and Batman in a timeless dimension. Sulphur used stolen tools of the trade to take over Gotham City, but as you may suspect, he was soon stopped by Batman and Superman, who had escaped from the timeless dimension. These things happen, man. They're superheroes. Sorry, dude. Number 6. Condiment King When the villainous Condiment King came on the scene, it was literally on the scene, as he appeared in the animated Batman TV show from 1992. One of the best, honestly. Condiment King was Buddy Stantler a comedian who was brainwashed by the Joker into becoming a villain. He wields condiment squirters and viciously horrible puns. Stuff like, I knew you'd catch up to me sooner or later, or how I've relished this meeting. Come Batman, let's see if you can cut the mustard. You get the idea, that was stuff like that. The puns get even worse in the comics, with his real name becoming a pun on its own. Mitchell Mayo. I am not joking. He is not taken seriously by anyone, including all of us. His weapons don't actually project his condiments at a speed fast enough to do anyone harm, but they sure are inconvenient, leaving nasty stains in your superhero costumes. On the other hand, he does potentially have the ability to be able to cause anaphylactic shock if he's battling someone with an allergy. Number 5. Flamingo Eduardo Flamingo, known as Flamingo is a world famous serial taker of life and an assassin. He is well known for a specific thing he does, which inspires 
acquired his sometimes name of the Eater of Faces, which really just explains itself. Eduardo was actually a morally strong advocate and fighter against organized crime, but that all changed when he was captured and underwent forced brain surgery that altered his personality, making him dangerously psychotic. Now the incredibly colorful flamingo is an enforcer and assassin, rocking a very unique look and somehow totally making a pink motorcycle not look silly. He has a dark, unfeeling personality and is an expert marksman which makes up for his lack of powers and makes him a pretty dangerous threat for Batman. He has even temporarily paralyzed Damian Wayne, so think twice before you judge cause he'll chew your face off, literally. Number 4, Lord Deathman. The Japanese crime boss known as Lord Deathman has battled Batman both in American comics and in Japanese manga using his powers to seemingly overcome death itself, able to rise from the grave no matter what his injury is. In his first appearance in Batman 180 in May of 1966, he passed away a total of three times using a yogi technique to appear passed away before the final conflict which saw him get struck by lightning and actually pass away. But since then he has actually gained the real power to come back from the dead, but at the cost of having a bare bone skull for a head. I don't know why. His regenerative abilities are so powerful that his sweet red red is used to create the infamous Lazarus pits that Ra's al Ghul uses to stay young and immortal. One of the first ways Batman defeated Lord Deathman with his new powers is honestly a little out of character for the Crusader. He threw Lord Deathman off a building into the path of an armored car which took the criminal down just like long enough for Catwoman to lock him in a safe and then he was shot out into space. <laughs> and he still, still somehow came back. Number 3, Pig. Professor Pig is a villain that came to be during a time when Batman stories were becoming incredibly dark. And Pig himself has to be one of the darkest villains of that time. His methods completely disgust the Dark Knight and also most of us. He looks like a character straight out of a horror or a slasher movie and his obsession with physical perfection, like the myth of Pygmalion, which is where his name comes from, became part of the reason that he turned his victims into his own mind controlled servants called Dolotrons. If his crimes were horrifying enough, then I mean just, just look at him. Yikes. No. Number two, Humpty Dumpty. With his house being demolished, his dog being run over, and his parents being crushed by a Christmas tree on Christmas, things were not looking too great for Humphrey Dumpler. He was mistreated by his grandmother, who he was forced to live with, and because of his appearance and mental capacity, he was also bullied. Of all things, the last straw for Humphrey was missing a subway train. Humphrey was obsessed with fixing things, and since the missing of the subway train, he started going out late at night to disassemble and reassemble mechanical devices which had upset him in some way or another. But since he wasn't very intelligent and all the info he got was from books, the things he fixed and reassembled actually caused a lot of accidents. The first thing was the same train that he missed which then crashed due to his manipulation. Now going by Humpty Dumpty, he was tracked down by Batgirl who dislocated her shoulder trying to save him. Humpty fixed her shoulder but then he also revealed that he had evolved from disassembling devices to disassembling and reassembling people. Namely, his grandmother who he believed to have been broken and in need of repair. So he took her apart then attempted to sew her back together again with bootlace. That got dark. And in at number one today, it's Cornelius Sturk. Cornelius Sturk is one of those villains that you don't hear about much, but is one of the more gruesome and terrifying members of Batman's rogues gallery. Sturk suffers from delusions which make him believe that he requires the nutrients of a human heart in order to stay alive, and not just any heart. Specifically, Cornelius believes that the heart is the most nutritious when it is full of norepinephrine, a natural hormone that secretes when a person is terrified, as well as adrenaline. So he uses his unexplained psionic ability to mentally make people perceive him as someone else, which other than allowing him to break out of Arkham Asylum the first time also allowed him to get close to his victims and then completely terrify them in the most insane ways before he quickly ends them and partakes in a nice old hearty meal. Pun intended. I think the interesting thing about Sturk though is that he is actually really effective at what he does, being able to evade Batman and even render him unconscious on one occasion. Number 10, Sorcerer Supreme, 1 million BC, Earth 91. 
Something that might be one of the most surprising things on this list is a reality where Man-Things rule the entire planet. Their version of the 1 million BCE Avengers team is filled exclusively with, you guessed it, Man-Things as a result. One of these Man-Things is known as the Sorcerer Supreme on his planet in the reality we know as Earth-91. Unfortunately, we do not get to know too much about this version of Man-Thing as he is killed by the Masters of Evil when they come to his reality in Avengers Forever issue number 5 from 2022. What we do know is that like Doctor Stephen Strange and many other Sorcerer Supremes, this man thing does seem to possess a cape, although it is a bit shorter than Strange's. His version of the Eye of Agamotto also seems to be something he wears inside his chest, as opposed to on a chain or a necklace, implying that this eye is perhaps a part of him, or perhaps it's simply just his own third eye? And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, be sure to show us you love us by clicking that like button. Seriously, it helps us out, feeds the algorithm. We must all bow down to the algorithm. Number nine, Jack of Hearts. Jack of Hearts is an exciting character, considering he had not been seen for years in the comics, but recently he surprisingly resurfaced in She-Hulk. Why was this so surprising? Because the last time we saw him, he died. Also, the last time he saw Jennifer Walters, he was draining her gamma energy, which caused her great harm. However, when Jack of Hearts initially resurfaced, his powers were seemingly gone, meaning that he was no longer a threat to She-Hulk. With him going to Jen for help, the two became close and even fell for each other, becoming an item. However, Jack would later get his powers back, and this would once more drive a wedge between them. And just when I was starting to like them as a couple too. Jack of Hearts is still around even now in the comics, and despite being unable to touch Shulky now that his powers are back, he and She-Hulk still decided to team up as superheroes and even fought together during the Fantastic Four event, The Reckoning War. Number eight, Kayla Ballantyne. Kayla Ballantyne was a love interest of Wendell Vaughn's, another lesser known Marvel superhero, but one who I felt was still a bit too well known for this list. Maybe we'll see him on a part two if we get to one. I love Wendell and I do feel like he does not get enough love on this channel or in the comics. Wendell was known as the hero Quasar and he initially hired Kayla to be an administrative assistant for his company, Vaughn Security Systems. It was during her time working for him and being his paramour that she ended up being granted the power of the star brand. And so for a brief time, she was technically a superhero. She had superpowers. Kayla made her first appearance in Quasar's own series in the late eighties, first appearance in Quasar issue number three. Number seven, Cosmic Ghost Rider. One of my favorite weirdos among those I've encountered in the Marvel Universe is Cosmic Ghost Rider. Cosmic Ghost Rider is actually an alternate reality superhero who has been known to get involved in the events of the main reality. Cosmic Ghost Rider hails from an alternate reality that isn't even solidified as having its own reality number yet, officially. It is currently known by fans as Earth-666, unofficially. Here, Cosmic Ghost Rider was once the hero we know as Punisher, Frank Castle. However, after Frank Castle died when Thanos attacked Earth, he he made a deal to become a spirit of vengeance, hoping to get some revenge, some sweet, sweet revenge. Tragically, by the time he returned to Earth to get his revenge, all his friends had perished and Thanos had left. Number six, Firehair. Firehair, who later became the host of the Phoenix, was a member of the 1 million BC Avengers, also known as the Stone Age or Prehistoric Avengers. Early on in her life, she was abandoned by her parents due to her distinctive red hair and was left to perish, as her tribe considered anyone who was different to be a threat. However, Firehair was rescued by wolves and grew up among them. Later on, she joined a group of prehistoric mutants called the Tribe Without Fear. Her powers eventually surfaced, leading her to bond with the Phoenix Force and ultimately losing her tribe. It was following this that she would end up joining the team known as the Prehistoric Avengers. Number five, Ghost Rider 1 million BC. You probably know a Ghost Rider, but do you know this Ghost Rider? Way before Johnny Blaze was even ever born, there was Ghost. Ghost is the original Ghost Rider, or at least he's believed to be the original Ghost Rider. The initial spirit of vengeance, retroactively. Anyways, as he made his first comic book appearance after Johnny Blaze, historically appearing in Marvel Legacy issue number one from 2017. Whereas, you know, Johnny Blaze appeared way before that. Ghost became the first Ghost Rider during the prehistoric era and did so in order to defeat the mysterious Wendigo who took over his pack, becoming their leader, only to eat the pack members, save for Ghost. Ghost would stumble upon a snake and speak its real name in order to become Ghost Rider, the Spirit of Vengeance. He would go on to join up with the Avengers of 1 million BC. 
Number 4. Star Brand, 1 million BC Vin, the star brand of 1 million BC, was ousted from his tribe and ended up discovering the apparent biblical paradise known as the Garden of Eden. He had been kicked out from his tribe upon them realizing he was gay, which was deemed unacceptable by his people. In the garden, he met and fell in love with Burke, a but their relationship was cut short when Burke died in a deviant attack. The deviants claimed the Deviants aimed to claim the garden, resulting in a cave-in. Though Vin was able to survive, Burke did not. Vin then found the body of the previous star brand, a dinosaur, and upon his discovery was imbued with its power. He fought against those who had killed Burke and was successful in acquiring his revenge, but tragically, he destroyed the garden in the process. Number 3. La Bandera La Bandera is one of my all-time favorite lesser-known superheroes. She makes her debut appearance in issue number 19 of Wolverine. What does she get up to there? Well, of course she runs into Wolverine, and the two team up together, with her becoming like one of his younger female mutant sidekicks that he always develops and often always becomes fond of, acting as a mentor or father figure to them. Bandera is no exception to that rule. She herself is a mutant whose powers allow her to inspire those around her to fight against injustice. Basically, she is mob mentality made manifest, though usually using her ability to hurt a mob for good as opposed to ill. Alas, Bandera was all too short-lived as a character, appearing only a few times in the 90s, which is why many folks likely don't remember her today, or don't even know who I'm talking about. Number 2. Phone Ranger The Phone Ranger is about as weird as he sounds. Armed with alien space tech that can tap into any communication technology, A.G. Bell, the phone repairman, decided to become a superhero. While he may be a ridiculous looking product of the 1980s, Phone Ranger actually also comes equipped with a bunch of communications technology, which also allows him to utilize and integrate with any other comms tech he comes across. Basically, he's like a spokesperson for phone tapping, trying to make the whole idea of it seem more heroic. In that regards, he's like a walking, talking propaganda telephone for the Cold War. Needless to say, Phone Ranger has only been featured in a few issues of Marvel Comics overall and hasn't even been seen since the first superhero Civil War. Number 1. The Almighty Dollar The Almighty Dollar is Jay Pennington Pennypacker, a minor superhero who appears alongside his fellow heroes on the team, the Happy Campers. They likely get their name from the fact that they all receive their powers while attending what Pennypacker thought was a self-esteem camp. In reality, the camp was actually a front for scientists looking to experiment with a device that would grant those exposed to it superpowers. After being exposed to the device, Pennypacker gained the ability to fire pennies from his wrists, which wouldn't be very useful today, especially in Canada, where pennies are also no longer in production at all. Also, in this economy, where pennies are really pretty much just worthless, unless I guess you have like a whole truckload of them. But his powers did prove good enough to help him and his fellow campmates rise up and escape their captors. So there is that. <laughs> 